here we are. Listen, I, um, I was supposed to be doing this with uh, Vera Furlock, and uh, she, uh, you know what happens in life, she uh, misplaced her passport, frantically searching for it, she had Claudia Christian over her house. I learned this morning in an email, in which I was chastised roundly by Claudia, saying that she did not flake out for your information, she said. Uh, she gave a reason why she couldn't come, and um, so it was not uh, because they don't, they, they don't love you, it's uh, there were things pop up, so, um, and I'm sure that will get back to them, so I want to make sure that you say nice, that he said nice things about them, okay? <laughs> because the women on that show, oh my God. <laughs> ah, thick skin, thin skin. Anyway, um, so Mira did want to be here. She called me when I was on the way to the airport. She was frantic. And then uh, by the time she got an express passport, it uh, had been canceled. So anyway, it had been rough on her. So, but she did want to see you. And this would have been nice, a nice little trip down memory lane to Babylon 5. So uh, I guess what I'm going to do is open it up. I don't have any set speech or anything, but if you'd like to just uh, yell out some questions or whatever you might have. Um, you know, I'm kind of schizophrenic here. Am I Tron? Am I Sheridan? Am I Tron? Am I Sheridan? So uh, I may answer a question as Tron. As who? Oh, that was it. Yeah, okay. That's for the old boys. And Scarecrow, too. So I'm really having trouble. And jet lag. So, anyway, uh, does anybody want to talk? Bring it, open it up. Okay, okay um, yes, um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, a few days ago, uh, Michael O'Hare, who played Jeffy Finkler, passed away. Do you have any curious with, with him you would like to talk about? Well, if you really want to go down that road, uh, I was very sad when I got the news, I was shocked. But then we've had a series of those already. I've never known a cast of actors to, so many to, to pass away. I mean, you kind of you know, expect, expect that out of uh, maybe a very first Star Trek cast. They're all really people. It's the natural way of things. <laughs> But, and I don't mean that, I really don't. I mean, I don't know that's kind of, but to have now, uh, I think it's six members of our ensemble pass away, only since 1998, it's, uh, scares the hell out of me. <laughs> but Michael was a, uh, I didn't know Michael well. Uh, but I, when he came back to uh, do the two-part episode, uh, I found him very gracious, very professional. And he was a gentleman, and you uh, can't ask anything more of a person. You know, I didn't ask him. He didn't want to be my best friend. I didn't want to be his best friend. But we uh, we did the job at hand, and I thought he was a, a, a nice fellow. Um, and, and that's all I can really say about that. I miss Richard. I miss Jeff. I miss uh, Andreas, certainly. Uh, all of them. I mean, I, I can't just say one uh, more than the other. Uh, it's, um, but it is. It's so different. Uh, is there? You know, somebody's already said there's a curse on Babylon Five. Well, they can go to hell. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere soon, and um, when I do go, it's going to be loud and it's going to be nasty. <laughs> So, anywhere, and, uh, and don't send teddy bears <laughs> out the airlock. So, uh, anyway, that's all I can say about Michael. It, it was a terrific shot. It was two weeks ago. Uh, apparently, the Sunday before, he had, uh, had a heart attack, and he lingered until the following Friday and then passed away. He had been, been in some hard times, too. But I found him a very talented actor. 
So anyway, um, uh, we joked the other night, kind of sort of dark humor. Uh, Mira, Mira's husband, Gron, had a 50-year-old, 50-year uh, birthday party the other night. It was a huge party full of people. And, uh, I said, uh, well, I think uh, it's about time that uh, one of the women give it up. Because, uh, I think it would be a noble sacrifice. I, said, I nominated Claudia. She said no. Mira said no. Pat Tallman wasn't there. Uh, but, um, see, I mean, we're sick people. But, um, no, it's just I, I've, never, I've never encountered this. I've been in many television series, and they have so many, so. And then I find out, you know, last year I find out that Jerry Doyle had a near-death experience. He had a stroke, and he uh, ended up in a hospital, he's in a coma, he wakes up out of the coma, and is so startled he falls out of the hospital bed and breaks his neck and is in the thing for six more weeks. <laughs> I, I, he's telling me this on the phone, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you made that up. <laughs> no, he didn't. And only Jerry Doyle would do something like that. He lives in Las Vegas. I don't see him uh, often enough, and um, I only talk to him rarely. Uh, so uh, I'm going, please, please, God, don't do this to us, you know. Um, that's why I knew my flight over here was going to be okay. <laughs> God would not do that <laughs> to Qantas Airlines or um, Babylon. Ooh. We can't just have that happen, you know. Cindy Morgan was on the flight too, but. Well. <laughs> Anyway, all right, another question, anybody? What was the question? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, can't tie my glasses, I'm going to put them on. Yes. Hi, well, ah, there you go. <laughs> I am standing up, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a glare on these lights, so yes. Welcome to Australia. Thank you. And um, at the very end of uh, the series of Babylon 5, the Centauri presented um, that little drag in a box to um, the Hassan <laughs> of. Who? Yes. Oh. <laughs> not not the box. Drag in a box. A, a drag, you know, a little, little drag. drag. Okay. Yeah. So, like, a little drag in a box as a present to be opened on um, the son's 16th birthday. But we never uh -huh. saw what happened with. There were so many unanswered uh, ends. Okay. At, at the, so, um, you have to understand. Um, Probably, you know, I mean, I can't speak for Joel, but we had a lot of, um, there was a lot of things that, they weren't meant to be uh, unfinished ends to the stories, it was just, uh, you know, I think he was just trying to indicate that there was this other long life, I mean, you know, five year arc and all of that sort of thing. But television is a tough game, you know, we were canceled every year, <laughs> and I came on after the first season, we didn't even know if we were coming back, then the next season, we didn't know if we were coming back. Fourth season, we weren't coming back. That's why we did Sleeping in the Light. Um, very last episode. And then uh, we get word, uh, we finished uh, the season. Everyone tearfully said goodbye. And then TNT came to our rescue and picked up the fifth season, made it their own. And uh, we made uh, four television movies as well. So that was great. But a lot of things, uh, I think to answer your question, um, a lot of things had to be dropped, you know. Um, listen, it was a very ambitious show anyway to try to tell all those stories, all those arcs. Every character had an arc. Um, and um, you know, like I said, television, you have to be, be able to be malleable because, you know, things are going to happen. And uh, there's other people with uh, their jobs uh, are to make your life hell. Uh, network people and uh, studio people, and they have their agenda, and of course he had to adapt. I, I think he did a magnificent job. I'm saying all these things in case you people email him, and then, I, um, and then I've got another email tomorrow morning, how I am now the worst enemy of Joe Straczynski. Uh, wow, is he taking off, by the way. I mean, I just, uh, and another email got from Pat Tallman, his lady. Um, he has got like another two television series coming on, sold. Uh, he's got several 
feature films. I mean, he has just taken off, and, and rightfully so. I think he's probably, he's the, he's the best television writer I ever worked with in 40 years. And, um, you know, I, I think you can all attest to that. That's why you're sitting here. He's a great storyteller. Um, People skills. <laughs> but anyway, no, I, I'm just kidding about it. Joe's a perfect guy. Um, we did get along. You know, I didn't agree with everything, but uh, that's me. So, anyway. and to answer your question about the drac, I mean, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> it took a long time getting there, didn't it? <laughs> I'm trying to fit. You know, I'm talking for two people here. You want, uh, you want me to answer a question as Mira Furlan? <laughs> What else? Anybody want to talk about? Uh, Chris. Yes. In the, there. Yes, sir. I was actually going to ask you whether or not you had a mobile phone you could actually ring here and wake her up and put on last speaker. What? <laughs> ring my own line. loud speaker. Well, ring her up and put on last speaker. I've called her. What about it? <laughs> oh, that'd be good. What time is it there? <laughs> you know you people live in the future here. <laughs> when I go home, I'm going past back in time. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's about midnight. It's about midnight in the States. I'm going to use the old West Coast. Well, that's just what I want to do. Let's go wake her up. <laughs> I will text her in the morning. <laughs> it's late tonight. She'll get it tomorrow morning. Uh, but Claudia just chewed my ass out. I'm telling you, she gave me the... How dare you talk to the fans that way? She said, blah, 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 blah. She said big, all capital letters, chill uh, out. <laughs> no harm was meant. I'm sure they forgive you, they love you, and has she ever been here before? Yes. Yeah. Oh, then what the hell? <laughs> I see one Claudia Christian, you see them all. <laughs> I love to stir it up anyway. Um, anyway, what else? Anybody? Yes. Sorry, you, had, you actually had a real question? Yes, yeah, I did. Oh, okay. um, there was a, a new series that started here, Southern Texas, I can't remember its name. Um, you played a role in that as... GCB? Yeah, I think that's what, yeah. Can you talk about that series? <sighs> well, <laughs> GCB has been cancelled. <laughs> No, I just, I, uh, I auditioned for the role of Burl Lord, uh, to be the uh, romantic interest of, to um, Annie Potts' character, Gigi, and I uh, got the role. And I did five of the ten episodes, that was all I was hired for. And, uh, but I was promised I would continue on, and you know, hopefully, because uh, they liked the chemistry between Annie and I. And not since Kate Jackson in Scarecrow and Mrs. King had I found that kind of sort of uh, comedic, Comedian that had that similar kind of wacky uh, thing about her that uh, we played off well together. I think that we played well off together. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I don't know why. No one knows these. They don't tell us why it gets canceled. It probably wasn't pulling the numbers. Whatever. You know, I, I don't know. But I, I felt bad for Kristen Chenoweth, who is just a marvelous talent. And the rest of the ladies. And it, to me, it's it's another show. I've had a few television series, but for some of them, it would have been a, a really uh, Leslie Bibb, and um, um, it would have been a big break for them. A really nice showcase for them. They're very good. Anyway, if you see it, enjoy it because it's not going to last long. <laughs> um, anyway, but let's talk about Babylon Five. <laughs> Why? Bring them back dead. <laughs> Babylon 5 was a, was a ball. Um, that was the biggest, uh, you know, uh, for me it was a, uh, it came along at the right time. I just got married. I, was, I had been on the road doing two hour movies and miniseries quite often, uh, being out of town for a long time. It was very nice. It answered a lot of things for my personal life. I could stay home, I could come home and sleep in my own bed at night. Um, you know, I have a home life as opposed to always 
sleep in some hotel somewhere, like I am now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, and and uh, what a good show! I mean, I saw only, I only saw one episode of it, but what I did notice of it was that it was very different from Star Trek. I remember in the '90s we were in outer space. We're not that you know, sci-fi. Sci-fi TV isn't in outer space anymore. It's I don't know where it is. Um, <laughs> I really liked it back then, because <laughs> it had that sense of adventure and uh, the unknown uh, to it. And, uh, but anyway, I, I saw one episode of that first season, and then when I got the call, when I want to come over to their offices and, and meet with Doug Netter and, um, and uh, the producers, the rest of the producers, um, yeah, I was very interested in it. And, uh, so they had this nebulous character, John Strider, John Stryker. John something with an S. And we decided on, um, I think uh, Joe decided on Sheridan because he knew I was a, a, uh, a later day cavalryman. I've always been a horseman. And uh, Sheridan was a very famous Civil War general, General Phil Sheridan of the uh, Union Army and Cavalry. And um, we were talking about the Civil War or something. And that's how brilliant this guy is. He gleaned that out. He, he, felt, he thought, ah, good, good name. Of course, it has to be J.S. <laughs> Jeffrey Sinclair, John Sheridan, Joe Straczynski. So, uh, anyway, uh, and then I just fell in love with the people, you know, and uh, the show, and uh, it went on from there. It's a great, great four years for me. I was very angry when it when it ended. I thought, why are we ending it now? We're just getting famous. We're just getting known to the mainstream audience and in the United States, a very famous little magazine that was probably in every home in America, called TV Guide. And it, it was a signpost that uh, you had finally made it. You'd been recognized by the mainstream media. And uh, instead of being this little cult television show on an obscure station all over at various time slots all over the country, you know, we were never on at the same time in America. For, for everybody in America to all watch. It would be on at 3 in the morning in Poughkeepsie, New York, and then we'd be on at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It never had a, a real fair shake, whereas all the Star Trek shows, <laughs> they were all on at 8 o'clock on Wednesday night for everybody to see, you know? Uh, we didn't have that advantage when I came on. And we never did until TNT picked it up in the fifth season. And then you had a uniform time for everybody to tune in. So it was very hard. Thank God for the web, for the uh, the internet, because we were one of the first shows to uh, be embraced by that, by fans using it, websites, you know, <coughs> chat rooms, and so on and so forth. And that kind of unified, that got the fan base got to be unified by that world, you know. And um, so that kind of that kind of helped. But uh, you look back on it now, and it's uh, the effects I think for the time. Very cheaply done. We were the little space station that could. We didn't have the juggernaut of Star Trek behind us, yet we kicked the S9's ass every night. So, uh, I love it. so uh, you know, it gave, it, it gave us kind of that feeling like uh, rebels, you know, we were, uh, we were against the, the establishment of Star Trek. And I had nothing against Star Trek. I mean, it was an okay show. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, I'm vamping like hell here, folks. Has everybody got anything you want to talk about? Yes. Okay. Bruce, um, yes. I'll project. You. Yes. <laughs> In 98, I saw a convention where Jerry Doyle was present. He, <laughs> and I just remembered a question that he said. He said, if you ever have the opportunity of speaking to Bruce, ask him about throwing up in the jackpot. <laughs> 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 Next question. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, for obvious reasons, we had, uh, we had a very big fan following in NASA, the United States Navy, and the United States Air Force. And uh, so Jerry and I were the only two fools that would, uh, when invited, uh, we would go out. I mean, I tail hooked onto the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln out at sea and uh, stayed a couple nights. And uh, 
the uh, guests of the, the Admiral there. And uh, so Jerry and I were invited to Edwards Air Force Base, a very famous place of the uh, place of the right stuff, where all the famous uh, uh, test pilots started in the early days, where the early space program really started. And um, we were invited to ride in these F-16 fighter jets. Now, most of us, we get in an airplane, and we take, uh, you know, even if it's a rough ride, you're not, uh, you know, you go like this. Yeah. Fighter jet, yeah, like that. <laughs> and uh, I had probably gotten myself nervous, you know. It was interesting, we had to take this in, uh, the day before, these emergency egress training things, so in case this bird died out from under us, we could bail out at, um, you know, 25,000 feet over the uh, Mojave Desert or the Sierra Mountains and um, survive. <laughs> now, I'm six foot two. An F-16 is like putting on these pair of pants. You literally put it, the damn thing on. And then I had uh, the lieutenant colonel who was the pilot in front of me. Well, Jerry's Mr. Hotshot uh, pilot. He will tell you that he was a business jet pilot. Uh, he's got a list of lies a mile long. <laughs> anyway, um, he, uh, so both of us were on the tarmac, and it's February, it's very brisk up in the high desert, and we're sitting there waiting, it's about uh, late afternoon, and the, I remember the young sergeant who was strapping me in, says, don't worry, sir, if you should go down over the mountains, there is a beacon that will go off them automatically. We will find you or we will definitely find your body. <laughs> well, now some of this has just really kicked in on me. I'm 47 years old, I'm a father of three boys, I'm married, I'm a guy that, what the hell am I doing in this thing? <laughs> and so I, I said over the, uh, the face mask to the, the colonel up front, uh, I said, please uh, give me the ride you would give your great mother, grandmother, okay? And he kind of went, oh yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, that was it. Off the runway we went, and we went straight up, and I passed straight out. <laughs> and you do that. They do that. When you're hitting those G's, you what they call gray out. The vision just went gray, and I woke up, and it seemed, you know, it was just like that. I was inverted up over the desert. I look like this, and there's the ground like there. <laughs> We're at 18,000 feet, and I look around, and I'm going, oh. <laughs> and uh, you wear these uh, inflatable shafts that, uh, because when you're going up that fast, all the blood leaves your head and your torso, and these inflate, so the Lord inflates and squeezes your blood back up into your body. Yeah, I'll tell you. And um, I look, and there's this dot coming at us from the desert floor, and that's Jerry and his. He took off right after me. And we proceeded to go and had a, um, a Mach 1 uh, dogfight. And I was just being wrung out in the back seat. And all I, all I kept trying to think of was all the wires I had that I had to, if the pilot says to me, emergency egress, egress, egress. By the third egress, I had to pull nine cables up, wires, under, be ready to tuck myself in as best I can, because we're going to go, a bomb is going to go off and shove us through the canopy at, uh, you know, several, I don't know how many hundreds of miles an hour. Uh, because they have to do that. They have to shoot you out of that thing, uh, because you're going to hit a wall. If you were to just stick your head up out of a, out of a, out of a fighter jet cockpit, it would take your head right off. So you have to literally be forced up through. So you can, Anyway, we didn't have that in that plywood star fury that I flew. <laughs> or the white star, which never left the ground, and we had little crystals and went <laughs> And I took that, the, the joystick, and all I had to do was do like that. He gave me the, 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 the plane later on, as I, after I'd stopped throwing up. And um, all I did was that, that plane literally went around. I said, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> and I had all these bags, I had all these pockets in the, in the jumpsuit, and I had all these puke bags in it, I'm sorry. It's just what it is. Air sickness is really rough, I want to tell you. And I, and I like a fool, 
Strangely enough, I decided I wasn't going to eat before. So I didn't eat all day. I had like coffee and a donut early in the morning. We didn't, we weren't on the flight line until three o'clock in the afternoon. So I probably should have had something, you know, I would have gotten rid of it. I probably would have been better. But um, anyway, it was uh, um, nothing but fun for Jerry. <laughs> now, you know, no one ever really said that he didn't throw up. <laughs> I'm the one who said, man, I puked my guts out. I got to go through all the facilities at NASA. I got to witness, you know, shuttle launches right there, right in the blockhouse and uh, everything. Go up on the gantry. So it was a lot of fun. Those were great years. I, would have, I had access to things that I would have never gotten before. And it was incredibly educating, too. So, uh, but uh, yes, I throw it. <laughs> Can I tell you? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, you tell us, let's get off this subject. Can you tell us any of the practical jokes that you've made on the set of Double on Five? Uh, I showed up. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Well, there was one that I've just been talking about. His name was Jerry Doyle. <laughs> he was a practical joke. Um, yeah, see, then, then we got a little crazy at conventions, by the way. Uh, I will get to your question. Um, and uh, Jerry would tend to bring uh, his favorite brand of uh, whiskey on stage, and the evening would just, just spiral down into a drunken, crazy show. Uh, it was nuts. Uh, I used to do that with him once in a while. But practical jokes, I don't know. I don't think there was anything, um, uh, anything really done. I, I think, you know, we were all too damn busy. And uh, believe me, it was a very busy work day on that show. Um, practical jokes. Oh, other than sometimes it'd be like, uh, you know, oftentimes when you're working with that, um, like the com Command and Control Center was my favorite set. It was a big stage. And as so Claudia and I did a lot of stuff, where, you know, where you could see out into space and we could see all the oncoming. Well, none of that actually exists, so we had little pieces of tape. And the crew guys used to like to hang little naked women up there or something like that. <laughs> you know, that was about the extent of it. And um, uh, I would not play into their jokes. They all tried to break me up, and I wouldn't do it. I would be very serious and steadfast. And, um, and so they, they got bored with that because they couldn't break me. And um, so, you know, but that's, that was about the extent of it. Uh, uh, there may have been some things in the trailers and stuff like that. Most of the um, joking around that we did was at lunch. Because we worked in a small, uh, relatively small area. It was a, a, an old hot tub factory named Aquatech. And they never took the sign down out in front. So that's where Babylon 5 was shot, at a stage called Aquatech. And that way, fans couldn't find the studio either. I'm sure they really had other ways, but um, it was basically a converted uh, factory into, into a sound station. I believe it's still working yet, but um, it leaked in the wintertime tremendously, and uh, it was stifling in the summertime, and with those uniforms on and everything. At least I didn't have to be like an alien person. I mean, Mira would, oh, here's perfect. Mira <laughs> Oh, John, oh, that makeup I had to wear all day long. <laughs> oh, that's, that she would go on and on about that. But yeah, those poor people had to wear all that latex and stuff. And, uh, uh, the only person I know, the only one that I know was Andreas Katsoulis. Um, he smoked. He was a heavy smoker, obviously. He was dead by 57. Um, but he would sit out in 100 and some degree heat. Now, what is that in Celsius? 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. Okay, I mean, on a black top parking lot, out back where all of our dressing rooms were, he'd sit up there and have a cigarette in that Narn outfit. He probably had to be double that inside, you know, 200 degrees. And he was, it was just nothing to him. You know, it was amazing. As soon as someone would say, cut, I had that jacket off. I was, you know, I mean, and we had some AC in the stage, but it was very hard stage to uh, air condition, so, uh, uh, but all in all, it was you know, fairly comfortable. But the, the crazy things like that, you walk outside and he'd be sitting there smoking a cigarette. Hello, Bruce, you know? <laughs> he was always Jakar. In fact, when I first got on the show, um, I hadn't met Andreas yet. And I saw him, and he was in makeup, and I said, listen, 
I've got to work the rest of the day. I don't really know what you look like. Uh, would you come back after you're out of makeup and introduce yourself? Because I, I'd walk right by you wouldn't even know who you were. I mean, and um, so that's how, that's how magical he was. He, he was that guy. You know? He was happier in that uh, makeup than he was in his real life. You know? I think his ex-wife made him sleep in a closet or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, sorry. Anyway, anything more? Because I am running out of material here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. How was it working with your wife on that part of the Oh, you had to bring that up. <laughs> ex-wife. Didn't John Sheridan have the ultimate solution for the ex-wife? <laughs> I didn't call him John Newcomb Sheridan. <laughs> Fifteen megatons right now on her head. <laughs> No, it was actually it was a wonderful time, very wonderful time. My, my youngest son, uh, Michael, was just a little baby, and this was a, uh, Melissa's first job back from having a child, you know? And uh, I, was, I was eternally grateful to uh, uh, the powers that be that uh, they hired her. And of course, fans were going, well, what happened to Beth? What's her name? Like, who was it, you know, who played? I said, well, it, we have a unique situation here. and, and um, uh, they were looking for any kind of promotion that could be done, and that was an obvious promotion. They have both of us doing uh, the sh the show that are doing a guest spot on the show, and uh, which is my favorite part of the whole thing was the Shadow War. That was my favorite whole arc of it. I think that was uh, you know uh, Sheridan's finest hours, if there was such a thing. Um, but it was great sharing it with her, and the little baby was out in the trailer uh, sleeping, and uh, you know go back out there. So those were good days. Really good days. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Oh, you, yes. Oh, I had a bit of Surprise me. <laughs> um, you said you had the occasional disagreement with um, J. Marcus Rizinski over your character. Um, well, mm -hmm. Is there anything in particular that you were pushing for that you would have liked to see Sheridan do? Well, it wasn't about Sheridan. It was just the, the, the show. I, I just, I've been a, you know, I've been a veteran of a couple of series, many series already by that time. And I just kept thinking, like I said before, I said, I don't see the, why would you say when you were going to end the show? Five year arc, I still argue with him about it. I, I don't understand the wisdom of that. He painted himself into a corner. And, um, oh boy, I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> Listen, as far as I know, everyone's entitled to an opinion. And that's my opinion and I stand by it. Like I said, we could have gone on for some time. Even if he didn't want to. Gene Roddenberry didn't write every Star Trek. He had a stable of writers. And you know, when I came on, we had, Neil Gaiman did a script for us. DC Fontana, Peter Dayton, there was a number of Joe's uh, friends. We had, you know, my God, we had, uh, what's his name as our, uh, uh, yeah, Harlan Ellison of all people. Uh, I think we had a lot of good storytellers there that could have helped, you know? with that, and he could have overseen the whole thing and taken care of that if he didn't want to. But, um, but it wasn't meant to, it wasn't meant to be, so, you know. It was, I mean, I, it wasn't a lot of things. I actually, we got along wonderfully. He was always available there because his offices were right there in the uh, complex there, and, um, you know, he'd walk in and go, Joe, Joe, and you see this little bald head stick up just above it, all these computers and things. It was great. I, you know, I make fun of him, and I, and I probably shouldn't. Um, I'm just jealous that he's such a freaking genius. And, <laughs> you know? And um, uh, launched, trying to launch this, my own project, Lantern City, I mean, I, I learned a lot from him. And, uh, and that whole experience of directly drawing on Babylon 5 for this thing. So, uh, but that's, it's not about that right now. Um, you know. It, it, it's you know it's just it's creativity often comes out of conflict, so if you, it's nice to butt heads once in a while. Everybody gets along. What are we all going to sing Kumbaya together? Peace, love, and rock and roll? No, man. As Ed, in his theory, you know, nothing comes unless there's chaos and conflict. That's what, what makes you stronger. And um, I was in that school, and uh, um, so I, I really dug that. You know. Uh, yes.
Um, yes, sir. <coughs> yes. Oh, sorry. That voice came out of you? Oh, oh sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> a high voice. <laughs> yeah. I'll make it lower then, if that's better. All right. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday, I, I was lucky enough to have a photo taken with you, and I said that you'd been on my lunch list for years. <laughs> and I was wondering. Well, let's, let's talk about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> lunch <laughs> list. Having lunch and a, and a good chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you mentioned. <laughs> yesterday that you're a big fan of history. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had a lunch list and it could be anyone in time, history, now, whatever, who would be on your lunch list? I would have loved to uh, sat and talk to Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He's my personal hero of all the figures in history. Um, mm -hmm. Simply because he was a man thrust into his times. Um, almost ill-prepared for it, and yet overcame them, and then paid the ultimate price at the end for it. So, uh, we have a great film coming out, Steven Spielberg, his Lincoln is going to be phenomenal. And Daniel Day-Lewis, I, I knew it from day one, he's the guy that should play it. He's an absolute, play Lincoln, he's an absolute chameleon. So, uh, I think that'd be it, that historical figure, I would love to have said. I'm a, I'm a, a, a boy from Illinois myself, and uh, we were kind of raised on all those mythology of, of Abraham Lincoln, his beginnings, humble beginnings, and everything. So he's down to Salem, and where he grew up and came to be a young man. And though he was born in rural Kentucky, he was born in just absolute aching poverty. And uh, I'm always attracted by characters like that. So and I've got a vast library on him as well. So anyway, anybody else? Lincoln, Lincoln for lunch it has sort of a nice ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, yes. Uh, Hi, Bruce. Yeah, oh. Uh, it was a bit, of, a, bit of an odd question. Really? On Zack Schneider's The Dawn of the Dead remake, Richard plays a uh, TV presenter mm -hmm. documenting the destruction of humanity mm -hmm. over the course of that six hours. Mm -hmm. And guess who turns up as the president at the end? Really? <laughs> yes. was, was your speech... It has such a Sheridan vibe to it, very presidential, very big vibe. Was it something you were just given, or uh, mm -hmm. where did it come from? Yeah, and I hadn't seen it prior to the day of doing it. They just called, would you like to come down here? And, and I did it. Um, I'd had prior experience with those things, so, uh, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, it was a very simple job, you know. Um, voice, I'm doing more voice work now than ever. I mean, I've, I've got a new, uh, video game, one of the most violent things I've ever seen, called uh, Special Ops The Line, which has uh, gotten some really good reviews. I play a crazed sort of Colonel Kurtz character that's uh, turned into a dictator in some post-apocalyptic um, Dubai. Dubai, yet. Um, but uh, I worked on that for about a year, and I've got Tron Uprising right now that's going on, which I really enjoy. And, uh, I think it's, I don't know, it's not playing here yet, is it? We've only shown about eight episodes in the States and we've got a whole bunch more to go. It just takes a longer process. It's on the Disney XD channel. And uh, it's as good as any of the Tron movies, that's for sure. Um, but we're not talking about Tron, are we? <laughs> this is Babylon 5. Yeah, where I babble on and on and on. <laughs> um, what else? You Hi, Bruce. Um, you go ahead. And have many voices. Yes. Um, yeah. um, what do you wish you'd known before you started out in the industry? What should of what? What do you wish you had known when you first started out in the industry? <sighs> um, that uh, no, ma no matter how much money you make in it, it's really not the important thing, and I think it overshadows a lot of stars, you know, of, uh, power, and, um, and, and money, and prestige. Um, it's kind of, I've kind of had a sort of a humbling experience in the last couple of years, so it's taken me back to, you know, to 
rediscovering who I am again, and not some image that people perceive. And um, uh, I think that's what it is, because it changes people. I've seen it time and again. It changes people, some for the good, but mostly for the worse. And they think it's going to continuously go on forever, and then when it doesn't anymore, it's shattering to them. Um, I think that's it, that money doesn't buy you happiness. All the money in the world, all the big cars, all the flash, and all that doesn't mean anything. So, but that's a lot of lessons in life, I guess. So. <laughs> anyway, why don't you ask me a question, okay? Yeah. Any other characters other than? No, no. That was right out of the mind of Joseph Michael Straczynski. And um, what I do think that was marvelous about him is that he would sit out and go to lunch with us every once in a while and sit out and listen to us all talk to each other and argue with each other and debate each other. And, you know, Jason, um, Jason, 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 Jason. <laughs> He had a way of getting under my skin. <laughs> One time we refought the revolution with each other. I said, you little palmy bastard, I'm gonna kill you. And uh, that's what you call him here, didn't you? I've been here before. Um, anyway, no, uh, Jason had that way. He would love to piss me off. Um, no, I, Joe was just very wise in listening to all of us, and a lot of times some of the, some of the, somebody's line would creep in, and I suddenly I said, I remember who said that, and it was at lunch the other day. I found it in the next week's script. <laughs> well, that's good TV writing. He knew his actors, and uh, he adapted these. You know, you got John Sherrod. Who is that? Well, you you watched Bruce Boxleiter like, day in and day out, day in and day out. Also seeing me in the rushes and stuff like that. So. Uh, he started to uh, really blending that character with my own personality, which is smart. Yeah. So, no, I don't think there were any other other real characters. Maybe I've said so in the past, but I can't remember anymore. <laughs> Conveniently. Anyway, anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure if this really happened, but I may have been channel surfing while drunk, but I'm pretty sure I saw Penn and Teller on Babylon 5 once. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> what were they like to work with? Uh, and I just said it. Right? <laughs> I, I grimaced when you said that name. Could you tell Somebody us? thought they were hilarious. <laughs> a couple of them. I can't say it here. <laughs> Maybe sued for slander. Uh, no, I'm not a big fan. Nobody was. We were all going, why are these guys, these Vegas acts, on our show. I know they were playing that, but uh, so I guess maybe that was the point behind it. But uh, the big guy, Penn. Hmm. I'll tell you straight up, I couldn't stand the SOB. You know? I wanted to get off the station. Somebody thought they were funny. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, that was a weird time in that part of the season. What does this got to do with Babylon 5? So, it was about me getting assassinated, remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they hit the wrong guy. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I'm going to make such enemies. Um, terrible. Yes, ma'am. I, I agree with you. Even if I wasn't in it, I, I, I would have said the same thing. Um, I think what, and I, that's why I really wish Mary was here. I know she would uh, think the same way. What I loved about it was so old-fashioned in many ways, and, uh, and romantic in that sense, that uh, we weren't uh, jumping into bed with each other in the second episode with each other. And it grew, you know? It grew from a very, uh, from quite the opposite. There was, you know, from the Midbari War, there was a lot of hatred and distrust and all of that. And through you shared it into Len, you saw those wounds heal to, this, 
until ultimately we became, um, uh, you know, a husband and wife, and then leaders, and and the pressure of that leadership. Uh, but I, you know, I, I keep going back to the that last episode, sleeping in the light, because I thought that those years, all of that finally came out. We really showed. This strangely enough because it was about to end for us. Uh, and on, uh, in, on the camera, in front of the camera, and in real life, this was about to end. Nobody wanted it to. Everybody was in tears all the time. Couldn't believe we were gonna not make, after, like I said earlier about the five year thing. Okay, grant, so that's what it is. You want to complete it. And we were being robbed of it. And it really hurt everybody. It angered me mostly, that's how I react. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, and, but it was a really sad time doing that episode. I mean, everybody on that, they, they, from the carpenters uh, that come out of the shop, if we had a few scenes, uh, we'd have people, if they weren't doing anything immediately, all the girls from the wardrobe department who were sewing things and stuff, they'd all creep in and they'd be sitting under the camera. Everyone watching, everyone sort of wanting to, to hang on to it a little longer, you know, to watch it, knowing that we weren't going to be seeing it again. And for us in front of the camera doing those scenes, it was it had just a whole added dimension. So it wasn't hard to get emotional. And uh, I think those scenes between she and I, um, it had that wonderful elegance about, you know what they're saying to each other, they don't have to say it. I think we respond to that instead of gushing all over each other. It was that sort of the two great leaders knowing that this uh, sacrifice is gonna, is, has to happen, and that it's, it was bound to happen. You know, I had that 20 years of, that Lorianne had given him, and now it was over. And uh, so, you know, it was just that what was unsaid, that's what's always fun to play, always a challenge to play, what was, uns what was not being said. You were talking, but what you were really saying would be emotionally, and so we had that opportunity. It was a really sort of classical, romantic story. You know, Arthur and Guinevere, you know? Only she didn't cheat on me. <laughs> but I did have an Excalibur, so there you go. Chris, I do have to ask, what was it like being in the presence of Lorraine Bracco? Because you were there with Andreas and Peter doing those scenes. <laughs> I might as well have just been the curtains. <laughs> That's the way I always felt. I said, no one's listening mean to me in this thing. They're all watching these two guys. They were marvelous together. They were really great um, Shakespearean characters, really. I mean, uh, just, just, just marvelous. And the few times that I got to be in some of the scenes with them, I, I, once in a while, I would just I would come from whatever I was doing when I wasn't on camera. Uh, I would come and just sit off camera and watch them, you know, just to enjoy myself, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their work. And uh, Peter and I go way back, you know. We came out to Hollywood around the same time, 1973. Uh, I think, you know, people may have, uh, through IMDb or whatever, uh, or YouTube, whatever, they found uh, that Peter did uh, Scarecrow and Mrs. King. And we did Tron together, and uh, who knew I was going to wind up with him in Babylon 5. And uh, I still talk to him uh, every once in a while. He lives on the East Coast, North Carolina. He's a professor. He has been working again at acting, but he has been a teacher for the last few years. He just walked away from it all. He got fed up with Hollywood, and that's not hard to do. And um, he just decided he and Barbara and his son Ben went off and had another life, and they've been having a great time. But there's so many things shooting there that he's getting jobs right and left. So I'm, I'm so happy for him. You know. He also almost left us, unbeknownst to most of you. Um, so another thing, he had his heart, he had heart surgery, he had his chest cracked open like a lobster and everything, you know. Um, and so, uh, my God, I don't want to fall off the stage now. <laughs> Someone please help me off the stage when we do. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to take any chances here. But, uh, you know, marvelous guy, marvelous guy. Um, anybody else? Have you watched Star Trek in the beginning and seen Sherry Pie, the spoof of Sheridan? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> what universe are you on? <laughs> the guys who made Iron Sky. By the way, my interview.
would someone have told me to shut up eventually? I think I'd talk for an hour and a half. What was going on? Coffee or something? <laughs> anyway, anyway what is the question again there? Have you watched Starwreck in the beginning? The guys who made Iron Sky Starwreck did a spoof yeah. where Star Trek and Babylon 5 went to war and one of the characters did wow. a spoof of you and it was Claudia Christian, everybody. Now that's the storyline we should have had. <laughs> I'm sure. I would have loved, loved to go against that Avery Brooks. <laughs> I'd love to have taken Jean-Luc Picard down a notch or two. <laughs> no, I've not seen it, obviously, but uh, I'm hoping they're having fun with it. Obviously, the boss is here, the man I work for here. Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, get, get, the, get the hell out of here. Yeah. Get the hell off your stage. Is that it? It's a, it's a, it's a, get the hell out of my galaxy, how about that? <laughs> You give me a ship and I will go. <laughs> <laughs>